My name is Elizabeth Roberts. I'm faculty in the Department of Anthropology, and I'm going to be introducing, introducing Alicia Galvez today. Um, before I do that, I want to make two announcements. One is that this talk is sponsored, obviously, by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and also the Department of Anthropology. So those two units brought in Alicia, and we have her here for a few days, which is great. And that leads to the second announcement, which is that tomorrow at 4 o'clock um, in 210 West Hall, we will be workshopping a paper of Dr. Galvez's that's entitled Deflecting the Blame, an Analysis of Mexico Pub Mexico's Public Health Response to Diet-Related Illness. And if you're interested in joining us for that, you would need to get the paper in advance and come having read, and then we work through the paper with her. Um, you can email me for that, and my email is lfsrob at umich.edu. So, okay, done with the announcements. And now I'm very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Alicia Galvez. She's an associate professor in the Department of Latin American, Latino, and Puerto Rican Studies at Lehman College in the City um, University of New York. And she is also the director of the Jaime Lucera Mexican Studies Institute at CUNY, which is the premier kind of clearinghouse and institute that focuses on Mexico and New York City. Dr. Galvez is a cultural anthropologist with specializations in the areas of reproduction, immigration and migration, Mexico and Mexican populations, immigrant health, health disparities, medical anthropology, chronic disease, religion, performance, citizenship, Latin America, and Latino, Latinas in the United States. So her research covers a very wide swath of territory. And she is, for someone who seems very young to me, she is very, very far along in terms of publishing a lot of things, including two single authored monographs. One, her first book was entitled Guadalupe in New York, Devotion and the Struggle for Citizenship Rights Among Mexican Immigrants, and that came out with NYU Press in 2009. And then her second uh, single authored monograph was called Patient Mothers, Patient Citizens, Mexican Women, Public Prenatal Care, and the Birth Weight Paradox. And that was based on medical anthropology research over two years at various sites in New York City. That came out with Rutgers University Press in 2012 and it won the ALLA Book Award by the Association of Latino and Latin American Anthropologists the following year. She also is the author of several edited volumes, too many for me to go into here, but currently she's working on an edited volume called Mexico, New York, 30 Years of Migration with um, Pat Patricia Ruiz Nav Navarro, and <laughs> she is working on another monograph entitled Eating NAFTA, Trade and Food Policies and the Destruction of Mexico, and she's turning in that manuscript in January, she tells me, and that will be with UC Press, so hopefully we'll see it next year, early in 2018, and she'll be speaking to us today from, with material from that book. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Liz. Um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you to Howard and everybody in uh, Latin American and Caribbean studies here. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and today we're going to um, go over, we're going to cover a lot of ground. And so I thought that we would um, start actually with Michigan. So this is Watercress. I was standing next to a colleague in my academic department for an event we had requested a catered lunch from the college's cafeteria. My colleague, who is from the Dominican Republic, and, uh, was serving herself salad, and she leaned over to me and whispered, there's a Dominican on the cafeteria staff. I can tell. She pointed to the leaves of watercress in the salad. Only a Dominican would put watercress in a salad. She tells me that watercress is considered a very typical food of the Dominican countryside. And while you do not see it often in New York, she read it as a coded message from one compatriot to another. We are here. Dominican food, like Mexican food, is probably woefully misunderstood and stereotyped. Dominican restaurants in New York specialize in black coffee and roasted chicken, stewed beans and fluffy rice, and sweet or green plantains. A lot of the items are fried, and you'd be hard-pressed to find someone, even a Dominican, who would tell you that Dominican food is healthy. But when teaching a course in Latino health and discussing food and health with my eight students, one young woman told me that every year when her grandmother arrives for Christmas, from the Dominican Republic, she brings a suitcase full of sweet potatoes and squash. 
Not only does she need these foods as part of her daily eating and cooking, she doesn't trust US grown sweet potatoes and squash and prefers to pay excess baggage fees to bring her own. That anecdote and my colleague's reception of what she took to be a secret message from a Dominican cafeteria worker to Domin Dominican employees made me wonder how many people's food ways are cheapened, stereotyped, transformed, and then maligned for their unhealthiness in the process of assimilating to the US. For me, watercress reminds me of my Michigan, Michigan born grandmother. And this is my first time in Michigan, but my grandmother grew up um, in Martin, which we found on Google Maps yesterday is a wide spot in the road between Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids. Um, she was the eldest child of six, and she was put in charge of family meals as soon as she could reach the top of the stove. I found watercress to be too bitter as a child, but I vividly remember standing in the kitchen counter with my grandmother as she made salad every night. For her, there was no dinner without salad, and no salad without watercress. While she chewed on stems of watercress, she would recall walking along the streams in the woods behind her family home, picking the watercress that grew on the banks in the shade. I was surprised when years later, in a South Bronx apartment, I interviewed a Mixteco-speaking woman from the state of Guerrero as she sat at her kitchen table. She was eating chicken legs stewed in a very spicy red chile sauce, using her teeth to soften the meat for her baby as he sat on her lap. Between bites of chicken, she plucked and ate leaves of watercress from a bunch standing in a bowl of water. I was impressed to see watercress. I think I'd forgotten it existed in the years since my, eating my grandmother's salads in California. I asked her what it was called in Spanish. Berro, she told me. I asked her if she ate it a lot. She looked at me like I had holes in my head. How many people would call to mind watercress when asked about Mexican food, or Dominican food for that matter? How many humble but clearly significant foods are forgotten in the transition to more urban lifestyles or with migration? How impoverished are our conceptualizations of regional and national cuisines without these foods? So now we're going to take a little journey that begins in Copenhagen and goes to Tulum, and then we'll eventually come back. In 2014, Rene Radzepi, celebrated Danish chef and owner of Noma, the uh, Copenhagen restaurant that was named one of the world's 50 best restaurants, filmed a video for the New York Times. Standing in a spare minimalist lit room, uh, softly, uh, a minimalist room lit softly by the Nordic sun, probably one of Noma's famed kitchen labs where his chefs explore fermenting, burning, rotting, and otherwise experiment with food and what some would consider non-food ingredients like bark, lichen, hay, muskox skin, etc. He announces that he will demonstrate how to make a tortilla. He introduces his assistant, Rocio Sanchez, a Mexican chef on his staff, who is, he announces, planning to open her own taqueria in Denmark. It's now open in case you are in Denmark. He says that for three months she was investigating tortilla and how to make it. He begins with the hard, dried kernels of corn, pointing to a selection in a small clay bowl. And the next step he narrates is to add calc. Rocio flinches ever so softly at the mispronunciation of the key ingredient, cal, ground limestone, but she doesn't correct the master. The corn is boiled in a mixture of water and limestone, left to sit for half a day, and then ground. He shows a molcajete, a rounded bowl-shaped mortar and pestle, more commonly used for spices or wet ingredients like guacamole, even though it would be a metate, a flat table-shaped slab of stone and a cylindrical rolling pin like gr grinder that would historically be used for grinding corn by hand in Mexico. But mechanical corn ground grinders have been used for decades in almost every town in Mexico. The nice fat ball of masa he shows is the final product of the grinding and kneading of the nixtamalized corn so generously proportioned that there's no way he could have ground it on the molcajete that he shows in the video. After giving the authoritative overview, Rocio pats the masa into little balls, presses them flat with a tortilla press, which he jokingly refers to as a technical marvel, and then places them on a diminutive cast iron griddle on a seamless, knobless electric cooktop. No flame, no firewood, no battered comal with room for half a, half a dozen tortillas. It's almost as though Radzepi is a food archivist, broadcasting from the future, working out of some post-apocalyptic kitchen lab in space, documenting long-lost cooking traditions dug up from Earth's past. He turns to Rocio. When are they ready? When they souffle, she says. The first one fails, and we're shown a quick frisbee throw for levity. The second one souffles like a pro. As Rocio works, he bends over the tortilla on the griddle, inhaling the aroma of toasting corn, and remarks, 
You can have Italian chefs talking about the difficulties in creating the right pasta. You'll pay 30, 40, 50 euros for a bowl of spaghetti because it tells the right story. But a tortilla can only cost, you know, 50 cents for one. You know what I mean. Maybe the storytelling has been wrong. And therefore, their appreciation for it. That's what I believe. But once you have the right consistency and the right quality of the tortilla, well, it's the perfect food. In the accompanying article, the New York Times style magazine, T, has a lengthy article dedicated to Red Zeppi's quest for the, quote, perfect taco. Quote, over the years, there, this is from the article, there have been pilgrims who have traveled to Mexico to experience mind alteration with buttons of peyote. But for Red Zeppi, a man who's often referred to as the greatest chef in the, chef in the world, transcendence comes in the form of enfrijoladas. You think you know what it's going to taste like, Red Zeppi says. This is, to me, the best mouthful I've had in Mexico. I can't believe the flavor of this leaf. Wow, I'm getting chills. Danny Bowen, who's accompanying him, an American chef, says, I never take pictures of food, but I have to. I have to, man. The magical leaf atop a tortilla with mashed black beans that sends Redzepi into a reverie is avocado leaf, an example of the kind of core ingredient, along with what are sometimes called weeds, like verdolaga, purslane, used by humble rural cooks for millennia in Mexico. Redzepi goes on, the first mouthful, soft, tasty, acidic, spicy, I couldn't believe it. My virginity was taken in the best possible way. <laughs> the article details a bro-fest of discovery between Bro Bowen, Red Zeppi, and a rotating cast of reverent Mexican chefs who specialize in creating newly rediscover rediscovered staples of, quote, Mexican peasant food. Alejandro Ruiz, Enrique Overa, Roberto Solis. Red Zeppi's mission to discover and celebrate such ingredients is referred to in the articles as a crusade. A follower of Redzepi has opened a restaurant named Heartwood in Tulum on the Caribbean coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, premised on the simple notion of charring using only a wood oven grill, wood burning oven and a grill. The article reads, it's like a whole new energy enters your body when you come out to these parts, says Eric Warner, the chef and co-owner of the Tulum restaurant Heartwood. As he says this, that energy is being delivered in the form of thunderous jolts to the spinal column. We're in a jeep heading into the thick, humid thickets of the Yucatan jungle, and the red dirt road is turning into a thumping riot of dips and jags. It's clear from Redzepi and his friends' exclamations, as much as the description of the New York Times reporter sent to follow them, that the trip is even more than a crusade, a conquest. Ready for adventure in the jungle, they discover and collect native ingredients and knowledge to take back to Europe and the United States, celebrating at the same time as they appropriate them. Paradoxically, Redzepi frames his mission as an anti-colonialist one. He says, for many years in fine dining in Mexico, you had the cathedral at the top of the pyramid. With chefs like Enrique Overa, the pyramid starts to become visible again. Trying in vain to shrug off the conquistador mantle, he suggests that it's his virginity that is taken, even while he characterizes this millennial and at the same time global and transnational cuisine as undiscovered. If it had not occurred to Mexican chefs to sell hand-ground tortillas with a market value of about 50 cents per kilo, not each, by the way, <laughs> for 30, 40, 50 euros, the way Italian chefs have done with their handmade pastas, it is occurring to Red Zeppi and the other celebra celebrity chefs who are reinterpreting and reviving the taco in global cities' rarefied world of trendy restaurants and their accompanying industry of cookbooks, blogs, and food television. In today's topsy-turvy world, Mexico's peasant food is shunned, made obsolete, marginalized from an economic model built on food security, increasingly inaccessible and even undesirable to the average citizen, but suddenly lionized by celebrity chefs and their pals. At Enrique Oveda's New York City restaurant, Cosme, fresh, corn, fresh ground corn masa is, is the star of the menu, and diners can easily rack up a $300, $300 bill for dinner, including drinks. Alex Stupak's Empeyon Cocina achieved momentary notoriety for its high prices and a 400-word essay by the chef about his refusal to serve tacos and the culinary racism of diners who demanded them of him. He was later quoted saying of Mexican cuisine, I like that it's an underdog. I like that it's undervalued. While Red Zeppi and his entourage plunge into the humid thickets of the Yucatan jungle, they do not notice, it seems, that they are in Quintana Roo one of the most developed states in Mexico. If you've been to Mexico, you might have been to Quintana Roo um, for spring break or to go to a resort to the beautiful beaches um, south of Cancun. 
Tulum, the trendiest spot, which is just uh, about halfway between Cancun and Chetumán. Tulum is the trendiest spot um, in the state uh, for travelers like Red Zeppi. It's home to yoga studios and Temascal spas built to look like pre-Columbian adobe constructed saunas. It's where expect expectant diners queue up for hours before Hartwood's ingeniously rustic dining room. And it's categorized as, quote, almost completely developed. Leatherman writes, quote, Quintana Roo has experienced a transformation from one of the most economically marginal areas of Mexico into a tourist bonanza, an unqualified economic success for Mexican government and foreign investors. It's a state which epitomizes the coca colonization and dietary delocalization of its residents' typical diet. And this is characterized by an abrupt rise in calories consumed, accompanied by persistent childhood mal malnutrition, <coughs> dramatic increases in diet-related illnesses such as diabetes and metabolic syndrome, and a lack of essential micronutrients that were plentiful in the past but are almost entirely absent in manufactured foods. Greater market dependency has spelled a decline in dietary diversity and nutritional status in peasant communities. While Rezepi bounces in a jeep seeking culinary inspiration in the jungle, residents in the same region have been experiencing an almost complete commodification of their food supply. Renowned for their resistance to Spanish conquest and their, quote, stubborn retention of the language and life ways, Mayan-speaking locals are now largely employed in the tourist industry as gardeners, hotel maids, kitchen workers, and more. They no longer participate in the slash and burn agriculture, uh, milpa agriculture of their parents and grandparents. Historically, the most essential component of the meal, Tortillas provide 20% fewer calories in coastal communities that are integrated in the tourist economy than they do in rural inland communities that are less embedded in wage labor. And now we're going to move again uh, to San Jose Miahuatlán, Puebla, and think, to think about corn. Fernando Escamilla and Candelaria Cordero explained to me the circle of life in which corn cultivation is at its center. They grow what they call criollo corn on small plots of land that lie walking distance from their home in San Jose, Miahuatlán. Their corn is largely rain-fed, although sometimes they pay for irrigation when rain is very scarce. Their corn takes six months to grow, but each harvest provides them with enough corn for their household's consumption for about half a year. Every day, Candelaria soaks a bucket of corn in minerals and water nixtamalizing it, preparing it for grinding, using techniques developed by ancient Mesoamericans to maximize the bioavailability of corn nutrients and enhance its digestibility. Every morning she takes the corn she soaked the day before to be ground at one of her town's mills. And here you can just watch as I talk um, what that looks like. Um, she pays uh, two pesos, or about 13 cents, uh, for the corn to be ground. From the co ground corn masa, she makes tortillas every day. And then depending on the occasion and her mood, she might make tamales, atole, tlacoyos, memelitas for her family. They also sell corn husks out of her f husband's uh, furniture workshop. Um, they charge the goat herders who live near their land a few pesos for the privilege of grazing their goats on the sacates, or fallen stalks, after harvest. They told me their corn does not like to be crowded. It's bothered by other plants. Although traditionally corn milpas in many parts of this region were intercropped with squash, tomato, and bean plants, a lively and intertwined ecosystem uh, containing the main crops for everyday consumption. Fernando and Candelaria plant their vegetables on separate plots, but the circular and self-sufficient production cycle that marks their seasons and their lives is helpful for weathering the ups and downs of their other economic activities. This is by no means a strategy for the generation of wealth. On the contrary, Fernando and Candelaria are vulnerable to market forces as well as climactic conditions and operate on a razor-thin margin of economic viability. They go into debt some years, break even others, and only rarely generate anything resembling a profit. Nonetheless, the fact that their own subsistence needs are covered insulates and protects them. While Fernando also makes furniture, he does not depend entirely on it. And many people I spoke with described multiple survival strategies involving producing as well as selling various items. In fact, one of their principal survival strategies has been migration. They have three children who have migrated to the United States. Two live in Las Vegas and work in the casino industry, while the third in, is in Oregon. And so here you can see these are um, a father and his youngest son um, grazing the goats on the fallen sacates. 
and uh, you can't see it, but one of the, the kid is wearing, I think, a New York hat, and the father is wearing a Las Vegas hat, which are two of the destinations that are popular in this town. Tortilla consumption in Mexico is declining. Long Mexico's most archetypal food, its consumption has dropped 15% in recent years. In cities, the decline has been even faster. In 2010, in rural areas, daily per capita consumption was about 218 grams, but in urban areas, about 155. Um, this is a difference that a researcher from the Institute, National Health Institute uh, attributed to what he calls a status issue. The Ministry of the Economy in a 2012 report on the corn tortilla value chain attributed the decline in consumption to multiple factors. The price of tortillas has risen 279% since the passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement. The price of corn is higher, and the increase in availability of new fast food products have led to what the health re researchers called in, in that particular report, lifestyle changes. I'm going to get a little wonky about corn for a few minutes, so bear with me. I'll try to make it digestible. Um, corn is the most contentious um, commodity in free trade between Mexico and the U.S., both during the negotiation of free, the free trade agreement and also since. Fearing a, a glut of U.S. corn, Mexico conditioned its signing of the North American Free Trade Agreement on certain protections to its corn growers. Mexico um, allowed these quickly to expire, which I'll explain in a moment. Mexico also agreed to give up the subsidies of corn cultivation. In the U.S., corn cultivation continues to dominate the annual farm bill, and you can see the staggering number of um, corn subsidies, and this is only uh, from 1995 to 2012, $85 billion. The result, U.S. cheap corn has flooded the Mexican market and made it, um, <coughs> and made it nearly impossible for small-scale growers in Mexico to grow corn for the market um, and also even for subsistence. Product dumping has also weakened the market. U.S. exports of corn to Mexico are up for more than 400% since 1990. A full fifth of that is uh, corn that's been dumped, expelled from the U.S. market just to protect, protect U.S. corn producers um, from further price decline. And dumping has cost Mexico six um, and a half billion dollars between 1997 and 2005. The costs and local economic de decline, the overall GDP, um, as a push factor in migration and biodiversity and in health are almost incalculable. So when we factor all of this into um, costs, we can see that U.S. corn is not so cheap after all. So just um, very briefly to kind of give, this is sort of the idea that um, Mexico's uh, economic um, uh, team uh, had in terms of how NAFTA would help the country. So there was an overall desire to end up with a fully industrialized economy and a fully integrated regional market. Um, and the starting point was a small-scale agricultural-based economy with a, um, more people dwelling in the countryside than in the cities. So in the, the idea was that NAFTA would go into effect, but it wouldn't completely affect corn, which was you know, really given protected status in Mexican economic policy um, forever. Until then, um, it would expire in 2008, and then by that time, that those protections wouldn't be needed because people would be working in other industries. Um, the reality, in fact, is that when NAFTA went into effect, in the same year, um, a corn deficit was diagnosed by the two countries. Um, and the tariffs that were supposed to take 15 years to expire actually were suspended immediately. So by 1996, there was um, no, no protection left for the Mexican corn industry. Um, the phase out of tariffs was complete by 1996. Corn prices fell initially. This is before ethanol started driving them back up um, by 48%. And some voodoo economics was used to decide that Mexico had a deficit of 8 million tons per year of corn that needed to be met by U.S. corn. Um, and so the U.S. corn um, began to flood the market almost immediately, but very importantly, um, there was never any sort of uh, protection built into NAFTA around corn products. So corn products 
immediately flooded the market. So there, um, and there's a distinction between um, white corn and yellow corn, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, we can see, you know, the effects have been numerous. Um, you know, the price of tortillas, just to give one example, has risen 279% um, since NAFTA. Um, so what does this mean in practical terms? While building a dam to prevent a flood of U.S. corn, Mexico left the, cor the, the floodgates open for corn products. When even the floodgates were not enough, quotas and tariff projects, products, sorry, tariff policies were adjusted to allow for even more corn products to enter. Even more insidious, virtually the entire corn deficit is met with U.S. yellow corn. U.S. yellow corn is inedible uh, without processing. Um, it's used primarily for animal feed and in processed foods like chips, snacks, syrups, and uh, syrups and cereal. It's been genetically modified to maximize its starch and sugar content, but it has less protein and important micronutrients that Mexico's la native land races of corn have. Um, almost all of the corn grown in Mexico by subsistence farmers, 91% is white corn, um, completely different kind of, of corn, um, used primarily for household consumption. Um, and some of that is industrial, so corn flour, um, but a lot of it is also for home use, as we saw with the um, ground, freshly ground corn. In uh, this context, the um, difference between corn on the cob that you might eat and corn that you might eat in the form of a tortilla or a tamal is the time that it's spent on the stock. It's not different varieties of corn. Um, so what we see is, in fact, dramatically increased consumption. As the consumption of Mexican-grown corn has declined um, and the ability of Mexican corn farmers to grow this corn has declined, um, consumption of U.S. Uh, corn has proliferated, most of it in the form of um, these kinds of snacks and sweets um, that now dominate every, um, I, I can't say food store, every establishment that sells anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the suspension of tariffs and over quotas had little to do with responding to a corn deficit, which I think in most people's eyes we would think meant a food shortage. Um, yellow corn is not food, at least not as we've defined it for much of human history. Um, a corn grower in the documentary King Corn said, we aren't about his own Iowa cornfields, we aren't growing quality. This is the poorest quality crap the world's ever seen. Indeed, even Mexico's economic ministry stated in a 2012 report, access to quotas and over quotas was given to stimulate growth in the Mexican livestock and industrial producers that benefited um, and were able to buy part or all of their corn requirements under con conditions similar to those of their U.S. competitors. In other words, virtually all of the corn being allowed to be imported without tariffs prior to the lifting of the limits on cheap U.S. corn was destined for animal food, uh, soda, and snack food production. Now we're going to shift to how NAFTA has impacted the population. Uh, and here, actually, here's a couple more visuals as far as um, increases in the importation of corn. You can see from NAFTA forward. Um, and then we have the um, U.S. exports to NAFTA, I mean to Mexico since NAFTA. Um, paradoxically, there's a flip side of the story that U.S. diets have gotten a lot healthier since NAFTA. Um, you can see that our consumption in the U.S. of um, avocados, bell peppers, cucumbers, limes, mangoes, papayas, and strawberries has dramatically increased since NAFTA. Okay, so we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, uh, the faucet turned off between 2008 and 2010. Mexico U.S. migration was found to have reached net zero in 2012. Actually, I have a slide that shows this. Slightly higher numbers migrated to Mexico from the U.S. than to the U.S. from Mexico in, in the last column. Opinions differ as to the cause, increased border security, risk associated with crossing, increased economic opportunity in Mexico, frustration with a lack of immigration reform, uh, lower birth rates in Mexico, higher education levels, um, forced deportations, 
It's clear that Mexican migration is no longer a one-way flow, and some have predicted it will not return to its historically high le levels. If we can talk, talk about a Mexico in a post-migration era, the push factors that promoted migration in the past, chief among them poverty, we would expect to have been alleviated at least a little bit. But actually, poverty in Mexico has not fallen, and by many measures, it's growing. Inequality has stubbornly refused to lessen, and by many measures, has increased, with the number of billionaires in Mexico growing and acquiring larger shares of the nation's wealth. The minimum wage is, in effect, 18.5% less than it was 20 years ago uh, today. When NAFTA went into effect, uh, Salinas, uh, Carlos Salinas, the then president, said that it was created to regulate the growing commerce between two countries, foster investment, and create jobs. He said it would bring an end to poverty and begin la gran época de la, del campo mexicano, the golden age of the Mexican countryside. They anticipated with NAFTA that the transformation of the Mexican countryside would occur. Um, and those who were present at the negotiation said that they expected 500,000 campesinos would leave subsistence farming and other rural occupations for jobs in manufacturing. In reality, half a million people per year for the next decade migrated to the United States, and even more were displaced to cities and in the countrysides themselves, with lands lying fallow due to lack of irrigation, cultivation, and rainfall. In spite of the plan to transform the countryside and relocate productivity, the transnational movement of workers was not to be negotiated. Luis Ernesto Derbez, part of the negotiations and later Mexico's foreign minister, said that regulation of migration was a non-starter in the NAFTA talks. Mexico agreed to take it off the table in order to prevent the complete disintegration of the trade deal. So what Mexico might have envisioned as a three-legged stool, a liberalization of the flows of goods, capital, and workers, became a two-legged and very unstable stool. Goods and capital would flow at unprecedented speed and ease, while workers would be obliged to follow jobs at their own expense, shouldering the burden of illegality as they went. With NAFTA, the stage was set for a transformation of the Mexican economy that would destroy many subsistence strategies of rural farmers and not allow them to move freely in pursuit of economic opportunities. The consequences included the illicit entry and work of Mexican migrants in the U.S. and the stagnation of productive activities in the rural communities. But we are increasingly seeing that migration has declined in importance as an economic strategy. In his futuristic and rather prophetic science fiction film, Sleep Dealer, uh, from 2008, director um, Alex Rivera depicts a post-migration dystopia where production proceeds at a rapid clip, all the work but none of the workers. Instead of crossing borders, workers travel to local maquilas where they literally plug into cybernetic transnational servers and mime the work that is being done by humanoid robots in the U.S. Migration is no longer viewed today by either country as central to economic progress. For Mexico, when you ask um, current government officials how concerned they are about the lack of immigration reform, they say that the existing unauthorized migrant population in the U.S. is a humanitarian question, a social question, but they don't really see it as an economic one. And they don't bundle it with trade. On the eve of NAFTA going into effect, U.S. President Bill Clinton said, we cannot stop global change. We cannot repeal the international competition that is everywhere. We can only harness the energy for our benefit. Now we must recognize that the only way for a wealthy nation to grow richer is to export, to simply find new customers for the products and services it makes. But the benefits of free trade are not equitably distributed, nor is the harm. The growth of the global middle class that's been trumpeted by pro-trade organizations is a process that enthusiastically leaves small and medium agriculture behind in the name of progress, modernization, and development. Monetization of markets and exchange, even in the most rural communities, mean that consumption is globalized. Expansion of markets, it could be argued, are, is complete in global reach, but still emergent in terms of reach to consumers. Profits are, are to come from the creation of consumers even more than product diversification. With technologies for reaching even the most remote communities, smartphones, internet, electronic banking, and more, distance from urban hubs is irrelevant. So too is purchasing power. Consumer credit, cash assistance, remittances, and labor force reconfiguration have made everyone a consumer. It's not necessary to earn like the middle class to consume like them. 
and NAFTA has produced and heightened the visibility of surplus bodies. Even while, in conjunction with Mexico's overall economic development plan, it has engineered their dis disappearance in the long term. Migration was a tool of choice for dealing with surplus workers in most of the 20th century. While the trade agreement resulted in an initial flood of new migration, especially between 1995 and 2005, migration has since tapered off and there have been other changes that have also transformed the population. Mexico's fertility rate uh, was 4.7 um, in 1980 and is now 2.2 per woman in 2012. Social policy, some call it social engineering, seeks to promote smaller family size and higher levels of education as a long-term strategy for reducing poverty. The program formerly called Oportunidades, which is now called Prospera, is a cash incentive program that rewards families, mothers specifically, for keeping their children in school, using contraception, and attending well-child visits. However, displacement from the countryside and shifting economic growth sectors have not absorbed a sufficient number of those born between 1985 and 2000. Poverty has grown to 52.2% of the population in 2012, according to World Bank data, a growth of about 7% uh, since NAFTA. Since people have not continued to migrate, but they also have not been absorbed into the economy, we can see that the crisis is especially acute in the countryside where old forms of marginalization persist, such as systematic discrimination against indigenous communities, poor infrastructure, limited educational opportunities, and more. And so we have what some have called simply the growing pains of demographic and economic transition. As Mexico has shifted from a rural economy to a service and manufacturing economy, temporary imbalances and displacements, I've been told, are to be expected. But increasingly, the promised rewards of the social and economic upheaval are not reaching those who have been the most violently displaced. Without having entered the middle class, their consumption, even of the most basic elements of life, food, water, education, healthcare, and services, is increasingly commoditized and privatized, with multi multinational corporations best situated to, take, to rake in the proceeds. It's becoming clear that even Sleep Dealer, the dystopian science fiction film about labor migrants who do not, who do not migrate to labor, was not dystopian enough, as it is now possible for the poor to consume, but not labor at all. In the same post-NAFTA period, Mexico's food system has been completely rehauled, resulting in a skyrocketing of diet-related illness and obesity, for which Mexico is now number one in the world. Rates of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and heart disease are on the rise, at the same time that healthcare has been transformed in ways that simultaneously defund the larger public healthcare system while converting the overall structuring of healthcare to market-based logics. Within the neoliberal structuring of the markets and healthcare system, the citizen consumer is empowered to choose market-based healthcare for herself. Risk prevention analysts bemoan the steep costs implied by a sick workforce, and here's some of the statistics in, from a Spanish infographic. Um, Overall, uh, the problem, however, has been framed by the government and most of the healthcare foundations in Mexico as a problem to be solved with education and changes in individual behavior. Exercise more, drink less soda. Within this rubric, poor, uneducated, unreliable citizens must take greater responsibility for their health instead of consuming excess junk food and soda and leading sedentary lives. Ignored are the breathtakingly conniving strategies that food corporations have used in Mexico to change consumption patterns in ways that are literally making Mexicans sick. The major changes in the way that Mexico eats are a consequence of NAFTA and the shift away from subsistence agriculture to an emphasis on food security. While intuitively food security might seem to imply food self-sufficiency or the ability of a nation to meet the food needs of its population, food security is actually a market-based principle that implies the ability of a nation to meet the food needs of its population without placing any value on whether those needs, uh, meeting those needs is the result of importing food or producing it locally. A country can produce no food whatsoever and be maximally food secure simply by having the economic means and distribution channels to purchase all of its food on the global market. A country's agricultural production can decline indefinitely as long as its purchasing power correspondingly increases. Older strategies for increasing and ensuring food security, such as the subsidies or setting of price limits on basic foodstuffs like corn and milk in Mexico, 
are not allowed in the market-centric model for economic development and integration that dominates today. The emphasis on food security has meant that Mexico now imports 42% of the food it consumes. And its agricultural production is largely for export, not subsistence foods, but specialty produce like the strawberries, tomatoes, and avocados that we enjoy. In fact, for Mexico to grow, Mexico to grow basic foodstuffs is increasingly viewed as illogical and inefficient. Uh, if the U.S. with its larger scale, capital intensive, and industrial farms can grow more than enough for both countries. Along with this shift uh, to an emphasis on food security comes a need for expansion of markets. So what we see is what Reardon calls supermarketization, the spread of supermarkets from big cities to smaller and smaller towns, facilitated by technological advances in shipping, cars, refrigeration, and so on. Rising incomes, marketing, and aspirations to consume in different ways can contribute to this process. U.S. direct investment in Mexican, and food, Mexican food and beverage industries grew from $2.3 billion in 1994 to $8.8 .8 billion in 1998 uh, in just four years, a fourfold increase. Grains, oil, and meat account for 75% of the U.S. agricultural exports to Mexico. In rural Mexico, the process of turning to supermarkets for basic foods uh, is significantly heightened, uh, aided by heightened access to cash. And two major sources of cash are the migrant remittances as well as conditional cash transfers. Migrant remittances in the early part of uh, the 2000s accounted for 20 billion US dollars per year to Mexico, dropped a little bit after the recession, directed lar largely to the rural communities that send migrants. But whether it's migration or plan family planning, education, that are shrinking rural family size and the number of workers available for agricultural label, labor, the effect is the same. Small-scale agriculture is no longer viable. The change in the Constitution in 1992 allowing for the sale of collectively held ejidos, many small plots, have been folded into large agro-industrial holdings and others lie unused. Families must now, because they're no longer growing food, turn to the market, increasingly the supermarket, to meet their everyday food needs, and they have the cash to do it. Seeing the vast expansion of processed and packaged food sales as a business opportunity, cunning Mexican entrepreneurs have joined forces with foreign multinational corporations to market and sell to new customers. Con Mexico, a lobbying firm dedicated to developing the industry of consumer goods, works tirelessly to ensure a favorable business climate for business, sorry, a favorable climate for business in Mexico. Their efforts are extraordinarily creative. They even managed to get Salomon Chetorivsky, the son of the founder of ConMexico, to be named Secretary of Health from 2011 to 2012, even though he had no public health or medical credentials. Thus, we observe not only the government agencies charged with e economic policy, promoting market solutions to social and health problems, but even the Minister of Health arguing that corporations should be allowed to self-regulate. Freudenberg uh, has documented the way that U.S. corporations have engaged in a concerted effort to promote what he calls hyperconsumption through the corporate consumption complex, a network of corporations, financial institutions, banks, trade associations, advertising, lobbying, and legal firms, and others. This has been facilitated by agreements like NAFTA and TPP, as well as pro-business neoliberal ruling parties in Mexico that have enabled it to in interject corporate in interests into local conversations about economic policy, public health, and consumption. We can trace in Mexico a complete rejiggering of the public health system towards one based on lifestyle, choice, education, and responsibility, all of which are euphemisms for a project that has defunded the public health care system and shifted basic functions of subsistence toward pro processed foods and beverages, pharmaceuticals, and other products, and away from local agriculture. The structural factors that contribute to the increased rates of consumption of soda and junk food are largely overlooked. Health today is portrayed as lying in the hands of the individuals and families, and diet-related illnesses are cast as a moral failure, an unwillingness or inability to properly care for oneself due to a lack of education and culture. These are old arguments that have long been used to justify the marginalization of Mexico's indigenous and poor and the almost total transformation of living conditions characterized by rural to urban and transnational migration, smaller families, less small-scale agriculture, importing and purchasing rather than production of food, and more are overlooked 
and the burden of concern for the health and prosperity of citizens is taken off of the state and rested on the backs of families. What is gained and what is lost by the shifts and ways of producing, distributing, and eating food in Mexico and the U.S. over the last 20 years? There are still those who insist on growing their own corn, even if they lose money doing it, because they enjoy eating fresh white corn tortillas. This is an example of what economic theorists call non-market behaviors. But are these quixotic characters who can absorb the costs and hurt no one in their pursuit of fresh corn simply remnants of an outdated and obsolete mode of production that can be expected to become extinct along with its last practitioners or simply be rescued by elite chefs? Or are there ways to ensure their long-term long sustainability, to value the bi biodiversity of Mexican corn, and ensure that traditional foods remain available and not only to the rich? Can families continue to live off the land and pursue economic and educational advancement without migrating? Will we need to remember the ancient art of grinding corn and making tortillas from space age internet videos filmed in test kitchens in Denmark? Thank you. subsidizing inequality uh -huh. that you could have picked, pushed right in there because Mexico has in fact increased its subsidies to agriculture's large producers in Sinaloa and Sonora and produce corn. Mm -hmm. I will look for that. I have his work in my bibliography, but I don't think I have that one. Thank you. So they're in, uh, he, he finds evidence that they're increasing sub subsidies? They have. Mm -hmm. How have they gotten away with that? They control. Them. They don't tell the Americans. No, I don't know the case of attention. Because the other thing with NAFTA is that the U.S. has become very aggressive in, in uh, court, right, suing for violations of trade agreements, even though we're the ones doing a lot of corn, a lot of dumping. So, so a curious thing is that when they had the negotiations, American subsidies were off, uh, off the table, mm -hmm. and Mexico just gave up. Yeah. It's uh, subsidies and other kinds of things. Yeah. Do you know if they, the soft drinks producers in Mexico use corn syrup to, syrup to sweeten their... They've started to do it more now. Um, with the soda tax a couple of years ago, they um, sort of started making a lot of noise about how in order to keep their product within reach of people with limited means, they were going to have to switch to a cheaper sweetener and use corn syrup. Um, and I think, I mean, we were talking about this today with um, one of the people who was involved um, with the modeling of the um, soda tax and its effects. Um, and it seems that to a certain degree they um, use that as a threat in order to get, it, get to the table where they proceeded to chip away at the soda tax and make sure it was as minimal as possible. Um, so, and, and the sugar lobby in Mexico is extraordinarily powerful. So, switching the corn syrup is a, is a bargaining chip um, to get the um, Mexican government to be more favorable to the industry if the soda companies promise to not switch as, as dramatically towards corn syrup. But there's a, there, increasingly, I know Mexican Coke is not that different from U.S. Coke. You know, there's the hipsters buy Mexican Coke in the U.S. because it's cane sugar. Um, but um, increasingly, it's, it's corn syrup. And it's not labeled in a way that you can really tell which, which is which. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. So is there evidence for that survey? Yeah, um, Rafael Mesa said today here at Michigan said that um, there's um, evidence that uh, diabetes doubled every decade from the 50s, which is sort of when a lot more of the processing happened. But there's also data that, um, that's diabetes, which obviously is um, one step several steps beyond um, obesity, but if you, but the slide that I skipped over um, shows how diabetes has increased after NAFTA. Um, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of the explanations that are given are kind of defy logic because I, the vice minister of, um, of health, who is the person who goes to the UN and goes to the WHO meetings, that and with a straight face told me, well, we have obesity in this country because we all have a giant sweet tooth. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, sort of this idea of the gula mexicana um, and, and this, you know, kind of incapacity to deal with, like, abundance. And um, there's just, no, it, it, it defies reason. I mean, there's really not overwhelming evidence to show that um, people like sweets more than they used to, um, and the jury is a little bit out even in terms of caloric intake, whether it's that much higher than it used to be. Because if you look at the caloric intake, for example, of there's a great book called Zapotec, Medicine, Zapotec Science um, by Roberto Gonzalez, um, and he shows that the corn farmers in rural Oaxaca that he was working with um, consume about 4,000 calories a day mostly um, beans, tortillas, and uh, squash, and chiles. Um, and they're, you know, climbing up and down mountains and, <laughs> you know, farming all day, and so they consume that many calories. As, I mean, they, they use up that many calories as well. So, um, you know, it's the, the caloric consumption is a little bit um, unconvincing, um, as is the idea that somehow people suddenly developed a sweet tooth. Um, I've also heard uh, the arguments about the Mexican population and genetic predisposition mm -hmm. to develop diabetes. I would recommend uh, Michael Montoya's book, Making the Mexican Diabetic, which um, really um, breaks that down because Mexico is a multi ethnic, uh, very genetically diverse country. So um, a lot of that data is sort of, is, some of it is based on relatively isolated indigenous communities in uh, Sonora state, I believe. Um, and that, you know, thrifty gene hypothesis might hold in some places that have relatively little um, genetic diversity, but the idea that the whole country somehow shares some kind of genetic predisposition is a little off too, I think. Yeah. but isn't um, completely different from what led to NAFTA. So the Rockefeller Foundation was very involved in um, the Green Revolution um, advocacy in Mexico to try to um, yeah, test. A, a project, so. Yeah, and so it contributed to very chemically um, intensive, um, input intensive um, varieties of, of corn and um, in, in the chapter, I kind of 
was drawing from a couple of different chapters, but there's one chapter where I discuss this at length and, and I ha contrast the corn farmers that I quoted in this section today with a corn farmer who grows hybrid corn and um, you know, the, it just sounds crazy. It's like, you know, you, it, it needs way more water, it, it falls over in the wind. <laughs> It doesn't, you know, it's not very sturdy. It, it sounded like the, even the words people use, um, there's a lot of language that kind of almost um, anthropomorphizes is the corn plant and there's all this obviously lots of um, um, history in Tehuacan Valley in particular in terms of the relationship between people and corn. Um, but the, the, so the, you know, this, this couple that I quoted, like they talk about their native uh, land race corn as being tough and scrappy and you know resilient and then when they talk about hybrid corn they describe it like a spoiled baby um, <laughs> and the language and adjectives that are used so it's very problematic and there's a long trend there's a um, section I have about a goat farmer who was being pressured to shift from chivos criollos you know the word criollo would be used for any sort of native races of, you know, in this case, goats, who, you know, he, he has a whole herd and he doesn't do anything. He doesn't, there's no, no veterinary costs. He doesn't buy food because they graze on the mountainside. He doesn't provide water because they get enough water from the little that's available on the, on the mountainside. And he was being pressured by government agronomists to switch to um, fancy goats, <laughs> he called them. Um, and he said, you know, oh, people will pay a lot more for the meat and, you know, they get fat a lot quicker, but it's kind of a headache. I have to, you know, they have to be fenced in. They, they trip and fall and die if I let them loose, you know, on the hillside. Um, you know, they, they need all this artificial insemination and, you know, there was just so much other stuff that went into it. And when we look at, you know, after NAFTA, but, but you know, even going back to this Rockefeller period, there's a lot of U.S interests that are being served by this, you know, shift away from uh, the land race, um, corn and, and everything else. Um, you know, all of the chemical companies that produce the fertilizers and everything, you know, it's just a, it's, it's a great business um, for some corporations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. First one uh, is about in your conversation with Mexican government officials, have at any moment the predominance of remittances in the gross uh, national project <coughs> been mentioned? What was it mentioned? Was it really rationalized in some way? And my second question is about the relationship of Mexico with Central America and the the emergence of some trade trade agreements in Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, and how that uh, has affected the flow of corn in, in Mesa America. I, mean, I was in Guatemala a couple of years ago in the border of Mexico, and folks are talking about uh, buying their corn from Chapas, buying their eggs from Chapas, mm -hmm. even uh, buying even I mean buying so many things from from Mexico, and imagine that uh, those yeah um, I don't know about that actually I'd be really curious to find out more about that um, I don't know if you can point me to any sources that would be very interesting to, to learn about the ripple effects southward um, I think part of um, my passion about this project is I feel like in the US all the conversations about food are very um, myopic and provincial and we worry a lot about what we're doing in this country and our industrialized food in this country without having much awareness of the ripple effects of our policy um, beyond this country and um, and now you've revealed that e even by making that argument I have a blind spot which is the ripple effect further south so I you know I'm curious about looking into that um, and then you you mentioned sleep dealer and there was another question and, uh, the question remittances oh yeah yeah, so they used to talk about that all the time, and Mexico has received a lot of um, 
favorable attention as being an inno innovator globally in terms of um, harnessing remittances with the dos por uno and tres por uno um, programs which um, maximize um, remittances uh, to, to pro projects in rural communities, you know, building a school or whatever in the state and, and the federal government will match um, dollars that are sent from abroad or pesos that are sent. Um, this year, interestingly, remittances for the first time were the number one source of income in Mexico. They surpassed oil. Um, which has never happened. Remittances were always second to oil, and that's even though remittances have declined a little bit since the recession and haven't completely recovered. So it's curious that there isn't more conversation today about that. Um, and I think that there's, you know, I keep asking um, whenever I have the opportunity to ask them, you know, what's, are you guys worried about, you know, immigration reform? Are you worried about remittances? And there, they, that, the official language that everyone uses is it's a humanitarian concern, we're concerned about the social, um, it's a social problem, how our countrymen are being treated in the US. Um, and they're very concerned about people taking advantage of double citizenship. So they really want, now it seems like the emphasis seems to be on Mexicans residing in the US to have full political rights in the US and push US policy to be more favorable to Mexico. There isn't a lot of talk about going back, and in fact, some of the policies about going back are awful um, and make life really miserable for families when they go back abruptly or even when they don't go back abruptly. It's, there, there's some really big obstacles that people face that the government's not being particularly imaginative about dealing with, um, and there isn't much talk about this faucet of remittances stopping. Um, so it's interesting. There, there, migration seems to have been completely severed from, you know, I think before NAFTA, they, they saw it as, you know, being inseparable from trade and, and, um, and economic uh, prosperity. And then they agreed to leave it aside, and it's almost like they don't even want to touch it now. Yeah. Yeah. May I ask, um, what was the culture of consumption of uh, the yellow and white corn? You talked about the producers and the right. fetishization of the difference in Denmark, but among, I guess, non-producing urban Mexicans, what did you find? Was there talk about the difference? Was, was there a cultural identification of that? People, and probably you guys should answer this, but um, people definitely talk about there's good corn and there's less good corn, and there's uh, a lot of um, conversation about how nothing can be, you know, a tortilla made from fresh ground corn, you know, that was grown on somebody's land. Um, that being said, most tortillas that people consume have been made from maseca in a tortilla factory, um, even in rural communities. And maseca has really dominated, and it's really the same corporation in the U.S., like Mission Tortillas are made by Gruma, um, it's, it's basically one company that dominates in both countries, just about everything having to do with tortillas. Um, so, just this is a very anecdotal, but I've, um, there's one, in Quintana Roo, um, not Tulum, there's a mid-sized city um, that I have done a, spent a lot of time in and do some research in, and there's a, one tortilla mill in the whole city. The city probably has, I don't know, three dozen or, or more tortilla places, even though it's pretty industrialized and it's not a town that is, has a good number of tortilla places compared to other places. But there's one that grows, um, that, that, sorry, grinds nixtamalized corn that's not maseca, not from the sacks of corn flour. And um, they say it on the outside of the, of the storefront. And it's not for gringos. It's not hipsterized. It's <laughs> for local people. And I took a picture of it and put it on Facebook and said, you know, look, next to my corn. And I got so many comments from Mexican friends throughout the Republic saying, why don't I have one of those near me? And so, you know, it made me um, realize, you know, this is something that's in the literature and it's something that everybody that I spoke to and, and research said, but, it, but sort of the transnational, mobile, um, very uh, un, unrepresentative selection of people were <laughs> felt that that was something pretty remarkable to, to see. Can I ask, was it phrased in a positive sense? Yeah. This is Nick Thomas or this is not Maseca? 
both. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it tastes different. It, it ta you know, it's notably different in taste. But even, I mean, there's just so many gradations, right? So there's corn flour that has been treated so that it doesn't go bad and can be stored for a really long time. And the Mexican government invested very, very heavily in developing the technology to dry corn and um, have it be shelf stable and um, corn grinders and tortilla presses. The Mexican government was very invested in all of that um, early in the 20th century. Um, and, and, but there's also, you know, there's just so many gradations. There's tortillas that are, you know, full of preservatives um, that are sold in Walmart that, you know, have, it's, it's another step beyond, you know, it's like there's, there's a whole spectrum um, between, you know, the, the grow your own corn, grind it, make your own tortillas to fully mechanized, um, commoditized tortillas and so many stops in between. But yeah, people will talk about how there's nothing to compare, but they don't have that easy access anymore um, to the fresh, um, locally grown corn. Yeah. I have a related question. Um, I've been in out of Mexico off and on since the mid-70s. Over the years, I've noticed restaurants in say, large urban areas offer you a choice of uh, uh, tortillas made with, uh, with, with wheat flour, mm -hmm. tortilla de harina. I don't mm -hmm. know how, how, how much that's been uh, increased, and I don't know to what, to what, to what degree it has anything, anything to do with that. Just a crazy question. But I thought it was yeah, I, in California, I don't know if you remember this, um, I remember always being told those flour tortillas that we eat all the time are fake. It's a, it's a gringo invention. You know, that's, uh, th that's not the real thing. <laughs> but in northern Mexico, there's a lot, you know, flour tortillas that have a very, very long history. So it could be, you know, the nor some of the northern states are so economically powerful now so the proliferation into other parts of mexico i've noticed that too could be because of the economic clout of the north and that people are moving around a lot more throughout the republic and bringing their preferences with them um, but yeah there's a long kind of history about whether corn is good for a growing nation and whether it contribute there's a lot of um, early 20th century stuff after the revolution in terms of the how um, productive workers could be if they eat a diet based on corn versus a diet based on flour. And um, so there's some stuff there too in terms of bread and, and tortillas and corn and flour tortillas that is very relevant as well. Were you gonna say the thing about the flour tortillas? Uh, yeah, no, they yeah. come from no, no way they own. Yeah. You know, which has grown in wheat instead of corn and since they're growing out. Yeah. You don't talk about health other than Coca-Cola, uh, except for diabetes. What about vitamins and proteins? Yeah, there's a lot of evidence that uh, the micronutrients that are available in the traditional diet are not available in the um, contemporary, more processed food-based diet. And um, there's a lot of ripple effects. Um, a lot of it, it's very difficult to point to causality. I think correlation is easier to point to as something we've been talking about <laughs> with Liz. Um, it's, it's hard to trace, um, but there's, there's, and there's a lot of things that are happening where there's um, simultaneous um, obesity, diabetes, and malnutrition um, happening all together um, with people having, lacking um, important nutrients in their diet. Um, and at the same time being told that they eat too much, um, which we know is not, you know, the pattern historically. Yeah. Thank you. It was very illuminating. I'm fascinated. And I'm Mexican. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the obesity in Mexico is such a complex identity. I mean, I really think that you gave us a very interesting point of view, but I think that there is a very complex obesogenic environment in Mexico that goes far beyond the access to food. Mm -hmm. uh, the, what I would call the crisis of uh, phys lack of physical activity is enormous. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important to take into account mm -hmm. this discussion. Yeah, and, I agree. Excuse me. And, and the other thing is, I know that uh, NAFTA started in the early 90s. 
But if you put some information far beyond the 99, it would be wonderful to see in the mm -hmm. graphics because I don't know if the trend of diabetes in the 70s, in the 60s goes up. Yeah. And the NAFTA increases that increasing trend. That would be very helpful to understand mm -hmm. if it's only NAFTA, what would have we see if not if NAFTA were not signed? Right. What would be the counterfactual of NAFTA? Right. So since we don't have that answer, how would that these pictures look if using the previous trends in the previous thirty or forty years mm -hmm. before? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think there is some data, and I think you're right that it would be good to, to include it. Um, at the same time, I think just the, the steepness of the rise since NAFTA points, it, it, it doesn't mean that NAFTA caused it, but there's, there, there are many things that are changing all at the same time. But, um, and I think, in fact, there's been an overemphasis on diet and also actually on exercise, because I think that one of the things that hasn't been considered as, as much, which is also related to NAFTA, is the incredibly steep increase in chemicals um, in terms of hormones used in meat and milk, um, uh, chemicals that are used in agricultural production, many of which are endocrine disruptors and have been shown to directly um, alter um, the way that the body metabolizes food. And so, you know, I think that that's also, you know, not really given a lot of um, attention. Um, the chemical companies are some of the biggest winners of NAFTA and the ones that we hear about the least. The Coca-Cola truck is very visible. Um, and it's easy to, you know, have it be our target. But there's a lot of invisible um, uh, pressures. The lobbying um, by chemical companies the amount that they spend on lobbying to get the regulatory frameworks, um, you know, to pressure Mexico to follow the U.S., not the EU, in terms of um, BPA, for example. Um, BPA is prohibited in, in the EU and Canada, so it's... there. Well, they were thinking about it, I think, um, as far as I understand, but then they were pressured to drop thinking about it. And, you know, if you think even about NAFTA, I mean, NAFTA is a three-way agreement, um, if we think about regulatory isomorphism, in theory, Mexico could be like, okay, we've got two partners, we're going to follow Canada's lead on this particular issue, not the U.S. You know, if it were anything resembling a multilateral agreement with, you know, relative autonomy on all three sides, then that would be possible. But the way that the, um, everything has been structured in terms of U.S. policy and the interests that are at stake, um, Mexico has been under tremendous pressure to adopt this exact same regulatory um, environment that the U.S. has, and so BPA is one chemical that's just rampant. It's in every everything um, in here and in Mexico. Um, so that's just one example. But there's there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, factors. I agree that are you know that that come to play and. Um, we can't, you know, I, I don't think anybody will be able to isolate one. I just feel like there's a cer there are certain, and, and what am I doing as a cultural anthropologist with this at all, um, you know, kind of following some of these tropes and ideas that underlie some of the policies, some of the assumptions that are made about what causes obesity and, and diabetes and what can be done to impact it. I think there's a certain am amount of um, implicit assumptions about people's behavior and, and you know, what, what can be done to improve it. Right. Nothing about GMOs? Yeah, that's big too. <laughs> I can't do another thing I want to look. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's big too. Because there's been a massive um, civil society movement against Monsanto in Mexico, and there's been some back and forth, there's been some victories, there's been some losses in terms of um, efforts to prevent um, Monsanto from um, control, entering the market, controlling the market. There was an initial injunction that prevented them from planting in certain regions because of fear that the, of drift, and um, there's a social movement called Sin Maiz, No Hay País, Without Corn, There's No Country. 
um, that has been you know, keeping close tabs on Monsanto's um, activities. Um, and I think the latest, you know, it's been back and forth, but I think the latest is that Monsanto won the, the most recent um, volley in terms of being able to um, plant more, plant and market their seeds more widely. Um, they started off just kind of doing it in, as, you know, field testing of, of new, new strands, but, um, and, and as the woman said over here on the side, there's been a lot of, um, a, a big push towards using the sterile seeds and preventing people from saving seeds, which is so important um, historically because the corn farmers that I quoted, you know, they, they would say, they told me that they knew exactly, you know, which varieties they could tell at the beginning of the year, you know, kind of how wet the year was going to be. And so they chose between a couple of different varieties, one that was more drought resistant, one that was less drought resistant. Um, based on you know what their anticipation of what the year was going to be like, um, you know if you're on this side of the hill you use this, if you're on that side of the hill you use this other because it gets more sun, you know, and um, very micro adaptations um, and and lots of um, people doing their own um, hybridization to to maximize different crop features. Um, but yeah, the GMO fight has been very strong and it's been, and again, it's another perfect example where Mexico is under tremendous pressure to adopt the same regulatory framework or lack of regulatory framework that the U.S. has as opposed to other places. We have time for probably one more question or, well, thank you so much. Thank you.